job market. So today we have three people with us. Uh, if y'all want to go down the line and introduce yourselves, that would be great. I'm Amy Petrasky, and I'm an assistant professor of secondary education and English education at Utah State University, Una Basin. I am Michelle Falter, and I'm an assistant professor of English education at North Carolina State University. I am Carl Young, and I'm an associate professor of English education at North Carolina State University. And I'm also the uh, program coordinator for undergraduate middle grades, English language arts and social studies. And I'm also the program leader for the literacy and English language arts uh, education doctorate program. And we had, so we had asked um, the presenters just to share, like not prepare anything ahead of time necessarily, but share a little bit about um, either their experience being on the job market or their experience being on the other side of the job market and actually uh, interviewing folks. Um, and so if, if each of you maybe want to talk a little bit about your different experiences and then we could just do questions from there. That'll probably be more generative discussion. Well, I was on the job market last year. I just finished my first year at Utah State University. Um, I guess one tip I would have for you going on to the job market is be ready to, for it to take up quite a bit of time. It's, uh, it, you know, you're going to spend a good deal of time putting together materials for different positions. Um, different positions may ask for some slightly different materials. Uh, and every position that you apply for is going to ask you for a cover letter, and that cover letter needs to be tailored to that job. You have to write it for that position. So it's not like you're going to write one cover letter and use it for every position. You've got to revise it for different positions. So. Uh, prepare to spend some time on it. So, um, I'll tell you a little bit about my job search, but um, <laughs> what's interesting about it is that. Do you need me to leave No, no. <laughs> is that Carl is the person who hired me to the position I have, so um, <laughs> it might be very interesting to hear what he has to say next. But, um, uh, so, I was on the job market last year, and um, I. Uh, I was finishing my dissertation at the same time of also actually starting a new job as an instructional coach for my last year of my PhD study. Um, and doing all of those things together was like crazy town. So um, just to start as advice, the more that you can have done with your dissertation before you go on the job market would be um, a, a really good strategy that I did not have, <laughs> but would have made my life a lot easier. Um, it was just the circumstances that it was. That being said, I still somehow managed to do it, but I really lacked a lot of sleep and a lot of um, time with my friends that did not really happen my last year of my PhD. Um, so I, um, I get, there's a lot of advice I can give you about the process. Um, I think what um, Amy was saying was right on in terms of, um, of tailoring to the jobs that you want, but you also first need to know what kind of job you want, um, and uh, or at least um, be open to different jobs and understand what those different jobs might be. So I applied to both um, uh, Research One universities or high activity research universities, which North Carolina State is, but also ones that were more, um, would be considered like R2, um, where it's a little bit more balance of teaching and research um, uh, in terms of expectations. Um, and so knowing the kinds of schools and what they expect um, for you to continue to be at the school is really important. Um, and how you tailor that in your um, cover letter to that. Um, so schools that definitely had higher um, teaching expectations, I talked a lot more about my teaching in my cover letter. Ones that were more research focused, I talked more about my research in them. Um, I think other things too is to be really organized ahead of time. 
Um, I had um, a spreadsheet of every school um, that I applied to for a job and I put things like who is the person I contact, what's the date it's due, what are the materials that um, that they need and then I would um, literally highlight once I get had those things done so that I could stay on top of it because it, it's a lot. Um, so besides cover letter and your CV you might also have to do a research statement, a teaching statement, um, a uh, diversity statement. And so um, there's a lot of other things that you might have to do, along with sometimes even um, a syllabus that you've written. Um, those are just, or, and writing samples and things like that that they might ask of you. So um, it's a lot to keep track of, and you can lose sight pretty quickly of like if you don't have a good organization um, for that. And then also I'd say like you need to really research the schools that you're um, applying to and by that I mean things like know who the people are in the department, read their work, know what they do, know how you fit within that department um, and, and make sure that you know you're not doing the exact same work as someone who's already there because that might not be the best fit for that school and you can still try I guess but I think they often look for people who are um, filling a void in what they already have. Um, and then also understanding what the mission and vision of the college is, which you can easily usually find on their websites. Um, but typically they're, they're going to ask you a question about that and how you see yourself fitting with that vision. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there and I'm sure there'll be more things about the other parts of the process. But yeah. Stop. No. Really good. <laughs> Um, I just made a few notes and uh, I hope you guys will uh, ask questions. Um, a, a lot of times you'll, uh, through the process, you'll uh, do a phone interview in addition to a, if, you, if you make it through the phone interview part uh, and get invited to campus. But I would say if you've never done uh, a phone interview or a video interview that you practice, um, doing that, it can be a little disconcerting if you've not done that before, especially uh, talking to multiple people at once. Um, it's, it can be disconcerting for the search committee in addition to <laughs> the candidates. Um, and I'll say I've, done, I've been on a search committee at two different institutions, uh, multiple search committees, and we've actually, uh, at NC State, we've had three over the last two years for the uh, faculty and doctoral program that I, I'm a, a, the program leader for. So it's been, it's been a very intense process over the last couple of years, but uh, very successful. We're very happy to have it. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that she mentioned as well that I think is really important is um, in terms of your presentation, uh, do tailor it for the institution. And I would say not just in terms of um, more research or more uh, teaching focus, but the way that you present it. Um, <clears throat> Michelle was very skillful in, in demonstrating that she was going to be a good teacher with her research presentation. And so, you know, thinking about how you can do more uh, with the opportunities that they provide you. So, uh, we've all been to presentations that are very straightforward and might involve a PowerPoint and someone reading from a PowerPoint, but that's not necessarily, well, it, it could demonstrate the way that you're going to teach, but uh, doing something that is more uh, representative of the pedagogy that if you're going to be a teacher educator uh, to demonstrate that, I think is really important. And I think <clears throat> uh, one of the kind of distinctions between an R1 and uh, a more teaching focused uh, university is that in an R1, the research is, is expected, but the, the teaching is a given. Like, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be a good teacher. We, we, that's kind of assumed when you come in. So it may not be uh, privileged in the same way, but it's kind of expected. Um, so I just say, don't, don't think that that is, is not, you know, an expectation. Um, so the, the visits, the other thing I would say is they're, they're going to be multiple Typically uh, two days, sometimes they might be three days. Um, 
when you have lots of them, you, you want to pace yourself and you want to, <laughs> you want to try to set it up in such a way, uh, if you're doing multiple ones, that, uh, that you can pace yourself. When you're there, you want to pace yourself. Uh, you know, look for times in there to go to the bathroom, to eat. <laughs> uh, you may not always feel comfortable eating when you're having to eat and talk with people. So just be aware that you're going you're gonna to be going from place to place to place. Um, typically, you'll have someone that is kind of a liaison for you. Um, you know, so lean on them uh, to, to help you out in, in that. In that process, um, and you may, you may not know. I did not know um, if I wanted to be in an R1 or another place, and so this process can help you figure that out. But you you don't want to necessarily let them know that you don't know. So when you go to the R1, you want to tailor things for the R1. When you go to the other places, you want to tailor things uh, in that way. Um, and, it, and it's okay to do either one. You can be successful in either venue. <clears throat> and you, you need to know that. And uh, if you are in a doctoral program that is preparing you for an R1, you may, the idea that you're going to do the other may not be a popular idea, especially if it's a larger program and it's very competitive. So you know, be okay with the direction that you want to go um, because you can be successful in either place, either direction. Um, if you do go, if you do, when you are with the R1, know that they're going to expect you to be able to talk about uh, grant writing and publication. Um, in my experience, and since I've been in the academy, the expectation for doctoral students to have uh, worked in for an R1 to work on grant projects or to get grants or to publish uh, just keeps getting amped up. It's because it's you guys are so good, so you, you're making it harder on yourselves uh, in some ways. But uh, just know that uh, that's, it's impressive, um, but just know going into an R1, those are things you're going to want to be able to talk about. And if you've not had that experience, it doesn't exclude you, but you want to be able to talk about you know, what your plans might be to be grant active uh, going forward, so to, to look into opportunities that you haven't had those opportunities yourself. Um, and if you're early on in your programs, look for opportunities to work with faculty uh, and on grant projects and research projects to, to be mentored in that way if you're not uh, getting mentored in that way. Um, be able to talk about a research agenda that would extend beyond your dissertation to so think about what is going to be coming next for you so that you can kind of demonstrate that you're you're making a transition, uh, kind of hitting the ground running. Um, just a little thing, a tire, just uh, you're, you're, you're going to want to dress professionally. Um, you want to, uh, and I would say tailor that for the, the institution a little bit too and what they have you doing. Um, just as in any educational environment, you're going to see people that are dressed in all <laughs> different ways, but you're making an impact, so I would just say uh, dress, you know, to make the impact that you want to make. Um, and then just to reiter reiterate, with, reiterate what Michelle was saying, be knowledgeable about the institution. I would say that on the front end, even if you're doing a phone interview, to be knowledgeable about the institution. They're going to want to know, <clears throat> we're going to want to know what it is about us that you want to be a part of, you know, what are, what are the connections that you're making uh, between the position itself and then uh, the institution, the department, faculty, research interests, uh, community, any of those that you can demonstrate knowledge of and, uh, and show, your, show a, a real connection, I think is important. I think I'll, I'll stop there. I apologize for, for coming late. My name is Amanda Tyner from the University of Iowa. I was like triple booked this morning. I know. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you guys, you two have both spoken and just shared yeah. some. Yeah, I'll take it. Oh, all three of you. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. So what kinds of things I'll briefly did you talk about that I can think about or something I can add? Well, just some tips for uh, 
to think about as they, as they prepare to go on the job market. Maybe one thing that hasn't been talked about as much is the things that you can do in your earlier years as a doctor <clears throat> to start to prepare yourself for the job market. Would, mm -hmm. would that be something that you could yeah. do? Um, so I, I heard Carl talking about um, R1 institutions, and I don't know if you talked about that too. Yeah, we talked yeah. a little bit about just a very little bit yeah. about the difference between. Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, when I was a doc student, I don't think I knew for sure what kind of institution I wanted to be at. Um, I was a doc student in Minnesota, and um, my advisor said, gave me really good advice, which is that, like, act as if you want an R1 position because it's much easier to sort of change your mind from, from there and go elsewhere than it is um, to change your mind, if, like plan to go to a teaching institution and then change your mind. Um, so to go along with that then, I think that the things that I would recommend that you make sure that you do in, in your experience as a doctoral student are, you know, to, to what extent it's possible in your program, um, get some teaching experience, certainly. Um, try to get some supervision experience um, out to present student teachers and get some kind of research experience. That's not always easy at a, at a lot of schools. It's hard to get, we, we don't have a lot of grant funding in our field. Um, if you can get on a grant funded project, that's terrific. If not, um, offer to work on projects with, with faculty members, with your advisor, with other faculty members, if that's the culture in your program that you can work with various faculty members. Um, get that research experience. I think even when I when I graduated in 2005, um, it wasn't necessarily expected that you would have publications coming out. I think it is really an expectation now, um, but it could be something that's co-authored with your advisor. But if you have one or two things you've done yourself, um, something in a place like English Journal or in if, if you're an LRA person in the LRA yearbook, um, there are lots of places where a doc student can get a couple of, of things out to get started. Um, that That's helpful because it shows that, it, it shows that you sort of understand the process of publication, for one thing, and um, that you have the persistence to see something through to publication. So I think I think those things are as important as, as a dissertation is in some ways now. Um, I think at, at one point a dissertation was what illustrated that you could be an independent scholar, and, it's, and it still does, but to work through the process of publication, um, it's important to be able to demonstrate that. And I also think, um, I mean, I wrote uh, quite a bit with my advisor, but we were working on a book project for most of the time that I was a, a senior graduate student, um, and I had a few small pieces when I got my first job, but when I wrote my first big piece, um, that whole process was a huge shock to me. Like that JLR would give me a reject and resubmit. I was like, what? You know, I thought I knew how to write a publication. I thought I had something smart to say. And I realize now, no, actually, like that's not a terrible decision. Like go <laughs> put it away for a couple of days, get it back out and start working and get it published. Um, but that process of, of publishing in a major journal um, will really, it, toughen you up, but it's really hard to go through it on your own for the first time, not understanding that process. So to whatever extent you can get on a project like that and learn how to deal with reviews and, and editors, I think that's really useful too. And I can't understate the importance of going to conferences like what you guys are at right now and, and building a network, um, not just with more senior people in the field, but amongst yourselves. Um, people that I know well in the field now who are my good friends and who I collaborate with are people I met when I was a doc student and a beginning professor. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I know I was, I remember going to LRA the first time and mm -hmm. I lost track of my advisor. We were at like a party around a pool and I was like, who are all these people? It seems like I'm at a sorority party and, you know, <laughs> will anybody talk to me? And I found like one person that I recognized, it was Colleen Fairbanks, and I was like, Colleen, I know you. And she was like, oh, come hang out with us. And they took us, took me out to dinner, and um, yeah, so if you're an introvert, uh, you just gotta get in there. It's actually not like seventh grade, it looks like. <laughs> People will talk to you. But that network is important, and then um, 
because this is a small world. People will remember you and um, even if you didn't meet Michelle and she had an opening, I talked to Michelle and I might say, oh, I met Megan, you should interview Megan. Right? Megan's not related to Sam anymore because she had a job. I would also say, um, you, know, get, you, you can look at your state publications as well. Um, like I wouldn't go for RTE in our first publication maybe, so <laughs> look for multiple opportunities to get published. Um, and to get involved, you can get involved at the state and local level as well to demonstrate uh, leadership. Um, if there's not a graduate student organization at your institution, that's something you could look at starting and building, um, you know, a network where you are, um, and that too demonstrates leadership on your part <clears throat> to get involved in the commissions. Uh, so the graduate, you know, there's a graduate student commission, but also to think about participating in the commissions because that's an opportunity for you to, if you have an area of expertise that you're pursuing, to make connections with people that are um, in the field doing the, doing that work. Yeah, and, and doing. Um um, reviewing for conferences and, and reviewing manuscripts um, for journals is another great thing to do. Um, you can volunteer to do that. Um, you can say as an editor, we're always looking for reviewers who will actually agree to do them and then do them on time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a, that's a great thing to have on your CV. Put absolutely everything on your CV. Keep your CV up to date and I think um, the second you do something, I would go straight to your CV and put it on there immediately because you start to forget all the things that you actually do. You do a lot of um, awesome things. So there's that. And then another thing um, that actually I, I felt like I read the book a little bit late because that's when it came out, but um, I tell everybody that I think this book is a really helpful book. Um, it's called The Professor is In mm -hmm. and um, it has this like, baby blue light cover. Um, I can't think of the author right now, but um, she also has a blog, and it's super, super helpful in um, thinking about the whole process from beginning as a you know, first year doc student going all the way through your first couple years as a professor, um, and all the things you need to do to get to the next step, whatever that next step is. Um, and she talks about things like how do you write a teaching statement, how do you write a cover letter, how do you do all that, and um, I think some of the advice in there, I wish I would have read a little earlier so I wouldn't have had to like jam pack everything in um, in the end, um, but I think that's a really a good, have you used it that is. too? Yeah. I, I haven't read her book, but her, website, blog, yeah. her website, her blog is really, really good. It's got lots of helpful tips. Uh, and kind of building off something uh, that Amanda was saying earlier, if you're not on a big grant, there might be some smaller grants that you could write to start getting some experience. For example, um, I went, at where I went to graduate school, the graduate school had a grant, an interdisciplinary grant, and a couple of us in English Ed got together with a, with a couple of grad students in library science and a couple of grad students in English, and we wrote a grant just a couple thousand dollars to bring a guest speaker to campus and to kind of host this event where this uh, guest speaker gave a talk about literacy. And so it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a huge grant, right? If your institution might have travel grants if, uh, you know, if you want to go to a conference and you need some money to go do that. So those things are also very valuable experiences and should definitely go on your CV because it shows that you're starting to start get at least some, you know, get at least some grant money. I agree with that and I also think that um, just the process of, of applying for a grant is yeah. important and if you have an unfunded grant, put it on your CV. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yeah. full professors do this because that it's a, a lot of work and it shows um, that you are engaged in the process of grant writing. It's a little different from Do we talk about cover letters? We haven't gone into the specifics of them yet. I think that the number one thing I'd say about cover letters is make sure that you are, that your cover letter addresses your qualifications for that specific job. Yes. Like I think sometimes it, you want it to, be, you feel like it should just be a brag sheet about everything you've done and how great you are, um, and it should be, but um, it, it, it really needs to 
be for that job. And sometimes you're applying for a job that is not a perfect fit for your qualifications, but that you can make a case for why you're qualified for that position, and that's what you're doing in the cover letter as much as anything else, so that, so that your application doesn't get tossed, like, no, this person isn't fit for this job. That's, that's I think, the number one goal of that, sell yourself for that position. So when job postings start coming out and when they jobs are, do start getting posted, they're on a couple of websites. There's Inside Higher Ed, and then there's also the Chronicle of Higher Education. Both of those websites have a job listing area. If um, you're a member of the Modern Language Association, MLA has a job list that comes out in September. And some institutions do list English education positions on the MLA list. Um, it, those, that tends to be institutions that have English ed positions in an English <coughs> department, but there are some jobs on there as well. So those are some places to go start looking. So you go look, you find a job listing, you want to read it very, very carefully. What are the qualifications? What, is it, what are they looking for? They'll have required qualifications. We need somebody who has a PhD in English education, has at least three years of teaching experience. And you definitely need to meet those requirements. And then there will be, there may be a list of preferred, preferred qualifications. We would prefer somebody who has published in something, you know, our, in this, whose work is in critical literacies or technology or, you know, young adult literature or whatever it happens to be. So you want to look at that very, very carefully. Then you want to go to the institution's website and look at some of the stuff that we were talking about earlier. You want to look at who's in that department. You want to look at the mission statement for the institution, for the college or university, as well as the school or college that you would be in within that and start to get a feel for does this seem like a place that you would be interested in maybe going to is this a job that you might be interested in applying to and you might have to do a little research um, to figure that out and then to use that research to tailor your cover letter because if you meet those preferred qualifications you want that in your cover letter <laughs> absolutely and I think too um, I mean Carl and I just were on a <coughs> search committee the search committees create usually create a rubric that's directly based off of the call, and because that is the fairest way to, to make a judgment on who is applying, because you all saw the call. <laughs> and so if you're not directly addressing the call, you're doing yourself a really big disservice. So, so I think that that um, also leads to some questions about like how many positions to apply for, yeah. right? And how broadly you adjust your net. Yeah. Um, I think I, I sort of have two feelings on this. One is that you cast it relatively widely because there are positions where if you go to interview, you'll be surprised that you might like a position that you weren't sure that yeah, sure. you would. Um, I had a, a student on the job market this year who, um, who did a number of interviews and, and um, really liked some positions at places that she did not imagine that she would. Um, and I think the position that she took is not one that she originally thought um, would necessarily be a place she liked and she absolutely loved it. Um, so to cast it wide enough that you are considering, especially when you think about like geography and stuff like that, if, you are, if you're mobile at all, like really widely consider geography. But I think the other piece of that is don't cast it so widely that you don't have time to really write good letters, um, good, good statements of purpose and, and um, good application letters for each of the places that you're applying. Or to finish your dissertation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, yeah, that's, I mean, the job market takes up a huge amount of time. Mm -hmm. A huge amount of time. And, honest, and honestly, if you look at an institution's website or you look at that call and you just really think, that, that, that's just not me, then don't feel like you have to apply to it. Don't feel like you have to apply for every single position. And if for some reason, I don't know, if you, if you know that man, I would just really hate living in wherever, I mean, that's just not a place where I would be happy, then, the, you know, that, that's okay too. I mean, cast your net as widely as possible, but also 
kind of know yourself and where you know kind of where you would like to be and what would make you happy yeah like, and, and I think that's also good etiquette like so when I was first on the job market there was a job at Texas that I really wanted to apply for and my partner said no I, I will never go live in Texas I absolutely refuse mm -hmm. okay I will not apply for the job at Texas which I, I would love to apply for so I mean if, if you have something like that that you know you're not going to take that job um, then there's a question of ethics. If you don't apply for it, don't go to the interview. Yeah. It's a lot of time on both people's mm -hmm. uh, both parts, both parties' parts. Yeah. And I think the question of like how many is like the good amount, just to give you an idea, I applied to 11 schools, and that was, that was good for me, and partly it was good for me because I was getting bites, like I was being interviewed by those schools. But if you're not starting to get bites, then I think you have to cast even further. So, and again, it depends on how mobile you are. I was very mobile, so I was able to. That that looks like a school I'd like to go to. That one does over there. So, you know, so I was lucky in that in that regard. But I had a student who applied to seventy schools. <gasps> oh, oh, she was worried she wasn't going to get any bites. She got a lot of bites, and then yeah. she got a lot of well, yeah. Jobs. I think <laughs> that was. She, I mean, I think. I mean, she yeah. was about to lose her mind going on interviews and, and trying to keep track of everything. Yeah. And I got really worried that she was like writing letters with the wrong university's Ooh. name on mm -hmm. it and things. So, I mean, that's way too much. I had a hard time keeping track with 11, so I don't even. <laughs> well, I, pl I applied to more than you yeah. did. I applied to, I, it must have been about 30. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But I did the same thing that you did. I kept a list of every place that I applied to, what the deadline was, what materials they needed, and then when I submitted it, I wrote down material, you know, I put, noted material submitted on this date. And yeah. then um, the thing is, is that sometimes this whole process, it takes time. So you yeah. may apply for a job and you may not hear anything for a very long time. Yes. So then if... Or if, ever. Or ever. <laughs> yeah. There were, yeah. I said, I think she was still having never heard <laughs> Yeah, it's also very idiosyncratic, and that's really hard. Like each university, each position, they want someone very specific, and yeah. it's very hard to know why it is that they want or don't want you. I had a great student who applied for about thirty jobs and was like got not a nibble, like one phone interview, and then got like a campus interview at an R one school and got the job. You know, yeah. um, it, it can feel very arbitrary mm -hmm. from the. From the side the of the, yeah, the applicant side, but when you're on the other side too, you know, it, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, the, you are looking for somebody, and somebody meets what you're looking for. Yeah. So you can't also take it, like if somebody doesn't hire you, you can't take it as like something's wrong with me, and I think that's really hard. Um, you know, I, I got lots of rejects before I got an awesome, you know, job. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just wasn't the right fit for them, and that's okay. I was the right fit for this position. So um, you just can't take that personally. And what it comes down to is who's the best, which candidate is the best fit for the position, and sometimes you just don't know why. So you know, what the search committee will do is they'll look through all the applications, they may use a rubric to evaluate them, and then they'll, they'll decide who they want to talk to on the phone or a, a, a Skype interview. Or there are a few places that do interviews at, at conferences. Um, I did one first round interview at, an, at the NCTE conference. Um, so that's People possible. People to sit on someone's bed really awkwardly. <laughs> well, thankfully, thankfully, they got yeah, just they just got a room at the conference, so we were just around the table. That that worked out very well. But yeah, no, sometimes I was like sitting at the vanity, and they were like six people sitting on beds. It's very strange. Awful. Yeah, so you yeah, be prepared for all of that. So that first round interview, they do that first round interview, and then the search committee will come up with recommendations for who do we want to bring to campus. And they'll pick two or three people. But then, once they make those decisions, they have to go tell the department chair. And then there's, there's, there's an approval process that happens. And then once the, the, the search committee gets the OK to bring people to campus, they'll bring two or three people to campus. And at that point, they're really looking at fit. Are they interested? Are, does your research agenda or teaching fit what they're looking for? Are you a good fit for the courses? 
that they want you to teach. Um, and then... And would you be a good colleague? Would you be and would you be a good stuff? colleague? Yeah. That's, that's why going to meals is so important. That's the do we want to have lunch with this person every day <laughs> test. And being, being really sort of excited about that university, that college, being mm -hmm. invested in knowing more about it. So those decisions are, I mean, the search committee puts forward a re recommendation, but the dean is really the person that hires you. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm an associate dean right now, so I've seen this from another perspective. Um, the dean really, like, he, he'll ask you questions about your research and teaching and who you are, but they're not so much getting into detail with you. They, they want to know, um, are you excited about this job? Um, would you be a good colleague here? Um, my dean will ask, I remember him asking questions of one candidate, like, um, so what are, what are your, your goals for the next five years? And he was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, have, you, have, you, have you done any grant work? Well, no, um, but I'll start thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, so a better question, a better answer is, I've, I've investigated these grants, and I'm, I, you know, I've applied for these. Um, in the future, I'm planning to apply for this and this. Um, do you have a grants office? Is there someone I can talk to about that? Um, here's where I see my research going. I'm really excited about working in communities in Iowa. Like you have these interesting rural communities. Like so, you're you you have a plan and you're expressing interest in being there. Um, it, and if what you say to the dean, like although that seems like a short meeting, um, is actually really important. It, some deans really take the recommendation of the search committee very seriously. Others will override it. My dean will override it like this if he doesn't like that meeting. So, so maybe it would help if we, a uh, campus interview. So what all happens at a campus interview? Depends on what kind of university it yes, is. Yes, <laughs> it absolutely does. So you definitely will meet people in the department and have meals with them. You might give a research talk. You might give a teaching talk. Sometimes it's a teaching demo where one of the faculty will actually take you into their class and say, you know, you're going to teach class today. And they'll tell you beforehand yeah. kind of what the class has been working on and maybe... Maybe, maybe they'll tell you. Yeah. yeah, maybe they'll tell you. They'll give you some idea of what, um, what they might like to see from you. Like, this class has been discussing this. Can you do a lesson on this for us? Because they want to see what kind of teacher you are. Uh, and then you will meet with the department chair one-on-one, -on -one, the dean, possibly um, one of the associate deans, the search um, committee. The search committee. Maybe a realtor. Mm -hmm. Who will report yes. back on what they thought of you. Yes. Mm -hmm. They yes. usually have like a, a realtor that, that works with their with the department, at least in some, mm -hmm. in, in my college. And the, I mean, it's not like the realtor has an academic view on you, but they will say, gee, I really liked that person. And, you know, or they, right. they say things. Yeah. yeah Same thing do. with like, you know, administrative um, assistants. <laughs> Be nice to them because they run the schools. Mm -hmm. um. We try to have um, candidates meet with doctoral students yes. as well, and then we do have uh, we do have a really strong research office within the college, and so they meet with the, the, those folks uh, too. So just to reiterate, you know, not having um, a talk prepared about your research and grant interests, I think, is really important if you're going to go R one. Um, in multiple contexts. I'll just say one thing about those talks is um, they usually give you, it's usually an hour long talk. Um, you really don't want to go over your 45 minutes. They, that Q&A part is really important. And if you if you cut it short and there's not time for the Q&A, um, that's not good, I think. And you need to practice that. This is not something that you wing. And I say that because I have seen people that it felt like they were winging it, or this they had this they had only rehearsed it in their head and not actually to people. Um, and so at the University of Georgia, where I got my PhD, um, uh, my classmates they would um, support whoever is going on the job market. Come together, professors would come to and give us feedback, and we would rehearse it and give feedback, and then. Um, sometimes do it a second time to see, you know, 
did we do better that time before we went out? And that was so invaluable. It was so helpful. That advice was just, because unless you are in front of people talking, you don't realize, oh man, I went way over time, I need to cut, or I did not have enough, or I don't know how to answer those questions, and I gotta think about that. If you can get in front of faculty in your program, those are, I mean, yeah, definitely. They'll, give you, they'll tell you the truth, because they want you to get a job. Yes. They will help you. And did you say that yours was, or did you say that hers was a little bit different from like a traditional job talk? Well, it was interactive yeah. uh, throughout the presentation, and it, in, it involved uh, materials, and uh, yeah, it was really good. Thank so, you. I mean, because I've only seen like PowerPoints and well, so, <laughs> so I'll say so just from my thing. side, when um, when I talk to people about doing that, some people are like, I don't know, I don't know if you should do that, and I in my gut was saying, no, I can't talk at these people for 45 minutes. One, I don't like to lecture, so I can't do that. And two, I, I, I wanted to show that I, that like, this is part of my philosophy, my pedagogy is dialogic, and so I don't want to just talk at people. So um, yeah, I was tied to her research, but but yeah. also the position we you know we knew that she was going to be working in a middle grade program, and we and. She nailed it. I mean, she demonstrated that she was going to be a dynamic instructor for our middle grades program. And that's what those folks need. Um, so part of what I said earlier is tailor your presentation, too, for the position and for the people that you're going in and, you know, to, to give it to as much as possible. Um, and, and like Michelle said, I mean, I think there are faculty that, that would expect more of that. Um, but again, I think it really depends on the position and knowing what the position was and um, who the search committee was and what, what we were looking for it was, it was, it was, it was good. Yeah, and I did adapt my presentation depending on where it went. So, um, so uh, some of the places that, that I had a, um, a campus visit were in English departments, so English at an English department. I'm in the College of Ed now. Um, so I actually incorporated a lot more um, literary quotes and talking about how my research connected with English um, in a different way than um, what they saw. So um, I found a way to make it fit the people who I was talking to. So. Whoever is your contact on the search committee will be helpful with you yeah. with those things too. I mean, don't be afraid to ask them. You know, what what kind of a what, what should be sort of the general? What's the audience? What, what, you can ask them some questions about that. And I think one of the things that you said, like, you know who you are, and you know what your style is, and you know the kind of teacher that you want to be in the space where you are. And so I think that while, yes, like, tailoring to the school that you're going to is important, I also think it's important to consider, like, who you want to be as a professor and an instructor as you're going into a place, because that's not something I thought about as a classroom teacher, and I went into a place where I did not fit, and it was a fight every day to be who I was in the classroom and to teach the things that I valued and to be the kind of teacher and use the kind of pedagogy that I valued, and, and I was miserable. And so I think, that, I think that that's a really important piece to this, too. Like, even if you don't know necessarily what kind of university you want to teach at, like, I think that you know the kind of teacher and researcher that you want to be in, so, you know, finding some place that fits <coughs> that as close as possible, I think is really important for, like, a person's sanity and, yeah, like, I enjoyment agree. of one's job. I, I think you should see it as an opportunity to interview them yes, as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, to go in with questions that you have um, mm -hmm. that, that you want answers to as well. And you really will get a sense from being there about whether or not you might fit there. One place I went just was not, just wasn't going to work. Yeah, I had a similar experience. Too. And then when I went to when I went to Pitt, which is where my first job was, I remember I called my husband. And I'm like, these are my people. I love these yeah. people. You know, like you, sometimes you really have a gut feeling like that. When you're at the end. And I I pulled one after, um, so I I pulled my name from cons consideration after one visit because I, I knew that it wasn't a good fit for me. Um, I don't. I don't think they felt the same. What they didn't, and I didn't tell them that. I just said because of certain things. Um, <laughs> but it was. Yeah, I knew. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, and I would say, you, yeah, this really is your opportunity what, at the phone interview, whether it's a phone Skype interview or the campus visit, this is your opportunity to interview them as well and ask them some questions that you, that you have. And one question that I asked a lot was, so tell me what your favorite thing about working here is. And it will tell, the answer to that will tell you a lot. Because some places told me answers like, you know, I love our students. Our students are awesome. And that made me feel really good about the idea of working there. And then other places, um, you know, gave me the impression that maybe they didn't like their students or that they, there was some conflict within that department. And so you can pick up on some of these things um, during this process as well. So definitely see this as an opportunity to interview them and to figure out, do you want to work for these people? Yeah. Can I, I want to give one more piece of advice. I, I think we should get some questions yeah. from you, too. Yeah. Um, I, I think of myself as an introvert, believe it or not. I, I, I'm a recovering introvert, I think. I talk a lot now. <laughs> but um, I'm not really good at, at speaking <clears throat> extemporaneously when I'm being in a, in a job interview situation with people that I don't know. So one thing that I did to prepare for interviews is um, think ahead of time about anecdotes I could tell from my research experiences, from my teaching experiences, um, from any leadership, things like that. I had like a set of like five or six stories that I knew I could tell that would answer a number of different kinds of questions. Um, people will ask you things like, um, you know, what was the time when, when you struggled as an instructor in a class or when you were challenged by, an, at, by something as an instructor in a class that you taught? Um, you want to be able to answer that, or what's a time when something surprised you in your research process? So if you have these kind of anecdotes that you can mold to answer multiple questions, that was helpful for me. If you're someone who worries about, I'm going to, I'm going to have a draw a blank. Well, just briefly, because I do think that you guys should definitely ask those questions. Um, the Skype and the phone interviews. Um, I had a cheat sheet for myself, yeah. and I, if it was Skype, it was right behind my computer, and I had what I knew would be probably the questions there, why are you interested in our school, you know, things like that, and I had little bullet points to remember, but then I also wrote little keywords that were like my stories that I wanted to make sure to put in there, so that they were there, so if I was getting nervous all of a sudden and I couldn't remember, I'd be like, oh yes, I need to talk about that. Um, and then if it's a phone one, it's easier because it's just right there. You can really look at it. But um, but that helped, you know, ease my yeah. nervousness. Well, I think we should get some questions from all of you. What would you like to ask? Us? I have a question about um, so English ed, like as you all have mentioned, can be either housed within an English department or an ed school and ed department. And I just it seems like there would be a lot of different dynamics depending on which department you end up in. So just mm -hmm. thoughts on like how to think about where you end up and how that might affect. Well, my position is a dual appointment. Um, technically, my home department is the School of Teacher Education, but I also kind of, I also in, in, have a foot in the English department because some of the courses that I teach are there. And you know, the English, you know, there are people in English who are part of you know, my tenure promotion committee. The my, way my institution does promotion and tenure promotion is each individual faculty member has their own committee. So I have people from English and I have people from the School of Teacher Education. And it's it's an interesting dynamic. Um, but I think if you're in a dual appointment, being, uh, being able to very clearly communicate with uh, people in both departments is very important. How common is that? I've That's a good that question. Before. I'm not sure. Um, some, so, you know, I don't know how common it is to be dual appointed, but. That's I've the way Purdue other. is. Well, it's pretty common. Yeah. That's the way Purdue is, but UT is not. Yeah. But I know we've had several graduates that have gone to, into spaces like that. So mm -hmm. There must be quite a few. One of my <laughs> colleagues is, is joint with English. I am not. Um, I, I think that if, if you I think there are differences between an English ed job and English versus education, um, but I, I think some of those are related to um, expectations for the kinds of things you publish. Um, although, I don't know, my, my colleagues who are at English departments, I, I generally get the sense that their colleagues understand that their discipline is a little bit different from the rest of, of English. 
Um, I think, like at this point in my career, I've, I've been at two um, R1 schools in colleges of ed. I think it would be hard for me to go to an English department at this point. Um, but I think when you're, I don't know, people move between them though too. They do. Um, I don't, I don't really think it's an issue. I think really you just want to talk to them about what it means either way if mm -hmm. you're going through the job search. Um, I think it's, it might be more to do with uh, classes that you might be teaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and the extent to which you might be involved in the, the licensure part of it. Yeah. Because an English department yeah. is typically going to do methods courses but not the methods course. Mm -hmm. so yeah. they'll, they'll do the uh, young adult literature, they might do a writing course, um, but they don't, won't necessarily do the capstone methods course. Um, Instead, you might be teaching an intro to comp class or something like that, whereas in education, I wouldn't be teaching. And I know some of my colleagues who have taken jobs at those places have talked about it being a little bit lonelier sometimes, mm -hmm. not having faculty to collaborate with in research because it might be, there might be only one or two of you mm -hmm. that are doing that. So I think looking at the numbers like that, I just, uh, I had a doc student, she just finished her first year at Kennesaw State and she's in the English department, but she has a lot of colleagues. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit different. So I think it's really gonna vary depending on, and so I would just ask, you know, come with your questions. I do think it's important to know in general to get a sense of how many people there are uh, that you're gonna be working with. You know, who will you be working with? Um, yeah, are you the English ed person? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, it's, there's some freedoms to that, certainly, mm -hmm. but that's also a, uh, quite a burden, so. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and to get a sense, if, if there are, my, my first job, uh, there were three of us, and uh, one retired after I took the position, and the other person left within two years. And then I was running the program, and, and I was told don't spend too much time running your program or you won't get tenure. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean, you know, as a second or third year faculty member? That's insane. That's insane. So, you know, find out, you know, kind of get a sense of who you would be working with um, and kind of where they are uh, in their trajectory. You know, if people are going to exit <laughs> right away. You And like, like she said, it could be empowering. You could see it in that way, or it could be, and, I, and I've mentored uh, younger faculty at other places where they find themselves in that situation and they just feel lost and alone, and you don't, you don't want to put yourself in that situation. Let me say something that's a little, maybe a little unpopular, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, remember that you're a free agent as an academic, right? So like the first job you go to does not have to be where you stay, and in fact you can stay for one year. Um, I, that feels to some people like, gee, that university just made a huge investment in me. True, but you made an investment in them too. And um, it's okay to go somewhere for a couple of years and leave. So I'll, just, I'll put that out there because I, I was afraid to, to do that. I felt bad leaving after six years, but, um, but you, you're a free agent, so. Yeah. I have a totally unrelated question. I thank you very much. I have to leave and the woman who was sitting here left her phone and I don't know who she was. Does anyone know? I didn't see who was there. It was, um, I don't know her name. Oh, it was Karen, right? Or is Karen? <gasps> Karen, yes. yes. There was Karen and there was somebody else there. I don't know which of them left the phone. In case she comes back. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to share a resource um, I came across. It's uh, Academic Jobs Wiki. Yes. Which is basically a... There's some pros and cons about yeah, that. Yeah, it can okay. be healthy or not healthy, no, depending on how you look at it. Um, <laughs> but it, it, what's nice about it is if you apply for a job, then you can get the, when are the phone interviews happening, when are the campus interviews happening, when are offers been sent. Um, but it's it's so based you know. off of whether people go and upload it. So yeah. sometimes nothing ever gets it changed won't be on there. So. Yeah. But it can give you a look if it's a particular institution that you have. Yeah, it would be my paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> It is 11 and we are going to start our next session around now, but um, so I'm going to like, turn this off if people want to keep talking while uh, our next group